Hello, everyone. This is Bethlehem Artfield. Welcome to the podcast Journey to Ethiopia with a story. In today's program, I'll be reading from my translation of an excerpt from Mentumwab, a historical fiction book written in Amharic by Hiwa Tafara. God created me a woman, but am I a weaker being? As per her promise to Gondor City and her nation, Mentawab decided to primarily stabilize the nation and keep the peace after her coronation as Empress Co-Regent. In order to make this possible and to reinforce her son Emperor Brahanasagat Iyasu's rule, she, along with her son, invited the nobles to assemble at Ashwagamp. And as was the custom during a coronation, they gave promotions and titles. Those lagged by their subjects stayed in their position, while those who didn't do well were demoted. To ensure the strengthening of her son's rule, she also gave her uncles Grasmat Nikolaos, Arkadelis, and her brother Weldalul the title of the Jasmat, commander of the main army. As was the custom, she ordered a feast on their behalf. From then on, she regularly started to discuss and ask their opinions on governance matters. Based on such discussions, she made the Jasmat Kombe the governor of the Jawi and Damot. The Jawis, however, rebelled as they had done during her husband, Emperor Bakafa's rule. She asked the Jawis their grievances. We want a governor from our region, one who understands our traditions and customs, they replied. It is written, whatever you do, it is wise to first consult with others. Otherwise, your work would be shoddy. Thus, she assembled the nobles at work Sagala Hall and discussed about the issue. The nobility advised for the Jawi's request to be accepted. Taking their advice, Mentuwab appointed Commander Waringa. The Jawis were ecstatic with this appointment. They became peaceful. Thus, Mentuwab learned the first lesson to good governance. For those who had helped in negotiating peace with the Jawis, she, along with her son, gave more promotions. She made her subjects happy, so she was happy as well and the nation was stabilized. She, however, noted that this sense of peace and happiness would not last long. So, aside from her discussions with the nobility, she also spent a lot of time deliberating governance matters with Nikolaos, Weldelul, Archelides, her grandmother, her mother, and her cousins. One day, in such family gathering in the banquet hall, Mentuwab said, What I deliberate day in and day out is how to govern this nation. I have seen on the day of my coronation how the poor have put their hopes on me. I do not wish to disappoint them. My main aspiration is to do well by my nation. My other desire is to show those who doubt my legitimate ascendancy to the crown because I come from Guara that I am indeed a capable ruler. I need your support to be a strong ruler. I primarily want to ensure Iyasu's crown is secure. For that to happen, peace must reign in the country. She thought she couldn't allow spending her entire reign suppressing skirmishes as had happened during her husband's rule. When Wildeluel's voice suddenly jolted her out of her reverie, she blinked a couple of times and shook her head as if to clear her mind. I understand how you feel burdened with the kind of hope the poor have put on you, but we believe that you will not disappoint them. We also understand how the Gondor nobility belittles you and doubt your capabilities because you are from Guara. Doesn't their saying, Guaras are nothing but shepherds, say it all? Ironically, the Guara they look down upon has given them you, the Empress core regent. 
So you have to prove your worth. Nevertheless, it is how you govern the people that should matter, not where you come from. You have to prepare yourself to deliver this expectation. Like you mentioned earlier, we need peace to secure the throne of Emperor Brahan Sagat Iyasu. Pacifying the nobility is a good way to ensure peace to prevail in the country. Aren't they the ones who are the closest to the public? They say Tanase Mamo, who was the governor of Damod, says those Quaras, he will inevitably rebel. We have also to reinforce security at Wainampa, the royal prison. He briefly looked towards the others for support and said in everyone's behalf, Nothing will befall you as long as we live. You, on your own right, are also a wise and strong woman. Resting her hand lightly on her chest, Mintawab said, Although I never imagined I may have to rule the country myself, I have learned a lot during the last seven years of my husband's reign. Before that, I used to think all a king needed to do was give orders to be obeyed. Kings can indeed make rules and order for it to be obeyed, Nicolaus interjected. Although the nobility are related to the king by blood or marriage, the king can at any given moment take away the title of privileges of any nobles. Haven't you noticed how no official can possibly even relocate without the crown's permission? However, the crown also depends on the nobility for keeping peace in the country. They are basically the pillars of the crown. It is essential to consult with them and make them malleable. The Vatanagast, the nation's supreme law, also recommends so. Haven't the philosophers also stated the one who only lives by his own counsel will either gradually get weary or fall altogether? The nobility are certainly essential as they are the ones who collect tax, who command the army in times of war, and act as judges in the local courts. They are also the governors of the provinces. If one of them decide to rebel, it means you lose the support of the entire province. Then you would need to wage war to ensure the collection of taxes due to the crown. If you don't succeed, they may bring a royal successor of their choice from the royal prison and crown him. The nobility who support you are the very ones who would quash such rebellion. That is why you have to keep them compliant through consultation, handing out privileges and promotions. The relationship is basically one of give and take. However, as promotions are based on merit, those who do not rule well will have to be demoted sometimes, even if they are loyal to you. I think I should follow the previous emperor's experiences and enforce my rule at the central part of the country, but let those remote provinces rule more independently. Give them leeway in the same way we recently did with the Jawis. Nicolaus agreed. As long as they pay their taxes, don't rebel, and they are fair to their subjects, you don't need to interfere in their rule. That's right. I want the public to trust them and me. How can I rule if they don't trust me, and I can only win their trust if I rule well. Well said, agreed her grandmother. You also have to properly handle the patriarch, the Lord Chief Secretary, the Minister of Pen, the Lord Chief Justice and other chiefs, said Waldalil, adding, Aren't they the most influential? Take good care of the army and your security as well. 
you have to take extra care with security because of your religious affiliations. The Tawahdo are wary of you. For example, that chief, what do they call him? He has been smearing your good name, saying she is a Qibar'at, a believer who stresses Christ's anointment more than his resurrection, and that you have converted the emperor from Tawahdo, a belief on the nature of Christ being both God and human. He basically also holds you accountable for the recent religious conflict within the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. If the clergy are against you, they will easily make both the nobility and the people rebel against you. That's why you have to make sure that your personal beliefs remain yours and not let it interfere with your governance. Mentuwab turned her face to her brother and said, Well, aren't there many good people among the Tawahedo? Are there are plenty among the Giba'at who are schemers? You know, if the Giba'at set their minds to rebelling, they may end up being worse than the Tawahedo. Don't we indeed know that? My desire, however, is to reconcile the two. Emperor Adiamsegat Iyasu purposely gave the prominent posts to the nobility and made sure the number of clergy in the crown service diminished. I think I'll do the same. During his reign, responsibilities were clearly laid out hierarchically. Orders from the monarchy were properly channeled down through the administration systems and executed properly. He even tried to set up parliament. He was a kind and forgiving ruler who favoured resolving conflicts peacefully whenever possible. Waldelul was astounded by his little sister's wisdom. The fact that the little girl, the precious sister that he delicately cared for, has now so much knowledge and has become fit to rule the country surprised him. His assertion, your biggest threat now is Bitwetta de Gyrgis, came to pass. The Earl Ras Bitwetta de Gyrgis declared that Emperor Bakava's brother, Prince Wilde Gyrgis, crowned. His army met with Waldalul's army at Wainamba, the royal prison. The Gyrgis attacked Waldalul's army from the top of the hill. When it looked like the Gyrgis was going to win, Mentuwab sent Nikolaos' army as reinforcement. Two days later, the Gyrgis was defeated. Prince Wilde Gyrgis was taken to court and the judge's verdict was for him to be executed. However, Mantua referring to the rule that royalty should not be executed, she changed the verdict to life in prison at Wenamba. The Earl was sent again to govern a remote province. After Earl the Gyrgis's defeat, the nation settled down again. Like the previous monarchs have done in the past, a year after her coronation, Mantua wanted to build her own palace. To make this wish come true, she dedicatedly supervised the work and made an equally beautiful and exquisite palace next to Emperor Bakafa's castle. About two years after her husband's death, Yoliana, Mntwab's grandmother, who raised her, who taught her royal ethics, who was distinguished for her religious studies and wisdom, passed away. Both she and her mother bitterly grieved. Yoliana was buried in a big funeral ceremony along with a lavish send-off. Only six months after Yoliana's death, her younger brother Nikolaos passed away. This uncle of Mantuwab's was a loyal advisor to her husband Emperor Bakafa and later to her. She relied on him to guide her in governance matters, to execute her orders and to defend her with his army. His loss created a huge gap in the royal courts. A few days after the funeral, 
Mentawab heard her older brother's distinct footsteps down the hall, hurrying to her quarters. Her eyes were glued to the door, wondering why Wildeye was unusually in such a hurry. After a hasty greeting, he said, "There is a problem." What kind of a problem, Wildeye? She asked as she got up. Tanase Mamu, who used to be a captain in the emperor's army, has rebelled. Her face shadowed with anger. What does he want? As we have heard before, he has been saying, "How long are we going to let the Guaras reign?" He claims he has no allegiance to Iyasu. <laughs> How long are the Guaras going to reign? She repeated the question and laughed out with sarcasm. I think he is aggrieved because of his demotion from the governor of Damod. He said, "If I don't crumble down this pile of dung, then I'm not man enough." Pile of dung? She asked in disbelief. He means you and your son's crown. Well, let's see then," she said, wagging a finger, flushed with anger. "What a bully! Let's see how he is going to crumble our rule. If I fail to defend my son's crown, I, Mentuwab, am not indeed worthy." Channeling her anger into action, she gave the order to assemble the royalty and the nobility and the army commanders. She sent a courier to summon the Wolo and Gojam nobles to mobilize for war. I they have a strong army. Meanwhile, she watched through the window the royal kids happily playing games in the courtyard. How can Tanase Mamu wish death upon my son just because he was demoted? She wondered. Promotion and demotion are an ordinary way of life among the nobility. It is nothing new. His demotion wasn't even recent. How long has he been plotting this revenge? In about an hour, when Mentawab and Iyasu walk into the meeting hall, the royalty, the nobility, and the army commanders were already there. The alarming smile that Mentawab usually has when she meets them was no longer on her face. Without giving them the chance to speculate what had happened, she told them about the mutiny. Almost all of the officials in attendance offered either some kind of military analysis or a plan of action. Finally, considering that Tennessee Mamo has a large army and had been plotting this for a long while, they suggested negotiations. Mentuwab's face turned red; her eyes bulged out. She bit her lower lip and started tapping her mouth with her left index finger. Are they saying this because I'm a woman, and therefore not fit to lead a war? Didn't Empress Sablawangel fight at Mount Debretamo when her husband died? Am I any less capable? She mused quietly. She took a couple of long breaths to control her anger. She started to look up at the ceiling. She was unable to contain her rage. I do not need negotiations, she roared. She bit her lower lip again. The officials, who were used to being honored and respected for their heroic deeds, did not expect this. They looked at each other in alarm. Not one of them dared to reply to her. Whatever will be, will be. Once a glass starts to crack, it will never be a worthy vessel. She walked a little and went back to where she was standing before. With a gentler tone, she said, "I never mistreated my people. I believe the public will stand with me and not with these selfish rebels." The entire hall was so quiet, a needle could be heard if it dropped on the floor. What do you think of me when you see me standing before you? I'm biologically a woman, but my knowledge and skills make me perhaps more capable than most men. The Creator has indeed abundantly blessed me. I lack nothing. So whom shall I fear? 
I shall not fear, even if the Meja, Yilma, and Densa, the Jawis and Damod, or even the entire Gojam rise to overthrow me. You know, half of Gojam is related to me. I'm also related to Emperor Minas on my mother's side. The nobility were astonished by her articulate speech and her decisiveness. So they said in unison, Hear, hear! As soon as she left the meeting, she ordered the royal herald to announce a decree for war mobilization at Jantakal. The same afternoon, the entire Gondor army assembled and swore allegiances to Emperor Mntubab and the crown. All the fig trees around the castle were cut. The twelve gates of the castle were shut and guarded by the army. Mntubab's uncle, Arkadelis, stood next to her and her son, where some tabled replica of the Argo Covenant were stationed for protection. Mntilwab heard how the Wayne Amba guard betrayed her by claiming that Iyasu had died and so released Hezekiah's Warrenya to become the new king. Tennessee Mamo went to Jantakal and proclaimed that Hezekiah was now crowned king. She was sad to hear that some of the newly appointed nobility switched their allegiances to Tennessee Mamo and that the clergy willingly praised the newly proclaimed king. The intimidated public went out and bowed to this new king as well. Tennessee Mamo's army went to the castle gate where Mintabwa was stationed and started fighting with Wildeluul's army who were alertly waiting for them. The gate that was guarded by the Jasmach Arcadalis was defeated. The enemy's army entered the castle and plundered and burned some of the houses. Then they started drinking arak and local beer. Soon they got drunk and were forced out of the castle gates. When some of the women of Gonda hear that Tennessee Mamo's army was winning, they took arms to support him. Their men also encouraged his army with war songs. You're the man, you're the man, break down the castle wall. Tennessee Mamo's army finally managed to break the castle gate where Mentawab was stationed. When Waldalul's army saw this, they were alarmed and confused. Waldalul gave a strict order not to retreat. Walking around his army, he roared, I promise by the heavens and earth, unless the ground caves under my feet, my feet will not leave from this ground in retreat. Thus will the Lul's army bravely fought against Tennessee Mamo's army. The frightening noise, gunshots, the clashing of swords, and along with the shouts of the wounded echoed around the entire castle. The castle gates were awash with blood and covered with dead bodies. Many people died from both sides. Finally, Waldalul's army won. The enemy retreated back to the city, burning St. Raphael's church built by Emperor Bakafa. Throughout the evening, Tennessee Mamo's army looted from residents of Gonda. They raped the woman and burned some of their houses and finally camped by the river Gaha. Water and food supplies to the city was cut by the rebel army stationed by the river. This went on for days and people and animals started to die. Tennessee Mamo told the clergy to excommunicate anyone who gives service and fight for the empress and her son. The clergy willingly did so. The philosophers, however, refused to obey. Mentewab sent a messenger to the governor of the Jawis, Commander Warenya, and Chief Gorgis, the governor of Meja, saying that Gondor is surrounded by the enemy and needed reinforcement. When Tennessee Mamo heard this, he sent a magician to bewitch Commander Warenya, but the magician was killed before he reached the commander. 
Tanase was upset when he heard his plan had failed and sent a message to the commander saying that Mentuwab and her son are dead and Hezekiah is now king. The new king has commanded him to continue to govern the Jawis. However, Commander Warenya and Chief Georgis did not heed his message. They mobilized their cavalry, their foot soldiers, ballistae and archers and headed for Gonda. The war that started in December ended in January, two weeks after Commander Warenya and Chief Georgis' army came as reinforcements. Tanase Mamo tried to retreat with Hezekias, but Commander Werenya pursued them and caught them. They returned back to Gondor with drums of victory resounding and the national flag waving. The nine-year-old Emperor Iyasu thanked God when the news of victory came to the royal court. He summoned the beloved patriarch, Abu Nataklahemanot, and declared praise to God Almighty, who made the victory possible. Drums of victory and the sound of umbilta, wind instrument, resounded in the city. The national flag flew high. The people of Gondor yelled. Hezekias was taken to court for treason. The judge's verdict was death by execution. But Mentewa once again reversed the verdict because of the rule not to execute royalty and sent him back to where he came from into the royal prison. The clergy that excommunicated Mentewa's army and servicemen were also taken to court for treason. Mentewa asked them how they could uphold the cross but be so quick to betray the official crown endorsed by the patriarch. What have I done to you to deserve this? she asked. They pleaded for mercy on the grounds that Tennessee misguided them, telling them that the Catholics were with Mentuwab. Mentuwab once again chose to give mercy. She gave titles and privileges to all who fought heroically in the war. Commander Warenya was promoted to commander of the main army, Tanase was executed publicly in the market square. The country was once again stabilized. Thank you for listening. Please read the discussion points under the description of this episode. We would like to hear your views on these points and any other observation you may have. If you'd like to listen to more stories as soon as they are released, please subscribe to this channel. Until the next story, goodbye.